some more announcements in later and also uh, I'll make sure and try to remember to send the email out later. I forgot to send it uh, before services this evening, so hopefully we'll make that up. So let's uh, start off by singing number 910, 910, Boundless Love. I don't know if we know this one, so if we don't, we'll learn a new song. If we do know this one, we're singing an old song. It's called Boundless Love. It's a rather simple song, beautiful song about God's love for us. It's 910, Boundless Love. Boundless love, unending joy, this is my life. It's what I know, I can't believe that he selected me, Jesus my Lord. It you I owe boundless grace because of Calvary, his life he gave, his love outpoured. I now can live with him eternally, Jesus my Lord. It you I owe. Oh, well, 884. <laughs> 884. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Down on my knees till in your own good time you answer my pleas. Teach me not to to wait in prayer for an answer from you. Teach me, Lord, to wait while hearts are aflame. Let me humble my pride and call on your name. Keep my faith renewed, my eyes on thee. Let me be on this earth what you want me to be. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are very mindful of the idea of needing to wait. We, we struggle with our life and, and misunderstanding and, and wanting our answers now to wait on you and your timing for for all the things you have planned for us and so we pray at this time that you help us to find understanding when we're waiting help us to find the patience that that builds and help us to be able to to find our way to keep pleasing you with our lives even though there are are some times where we just have to wait with that in mind we continue to pray for for all those who are sick and hurting, we pray that you watch over those who, who we've already mentioned that are, are in the hospital or, or those who are at home that have unfortunately contracted the, the pandemic. And we just pray that you watch over all of them, that you keep them safe, that you, that you allow their health to be restored to them. Be with their caretakers and help them to do their best job to, to, to make sure they're getting the treatment they need. Be with their families and give them comfort during this time of, of, of trial and, and worry. And we just again pray that during these times, people will look to you for your guidance and what you want them to do and be. We just pray for your guidance in, in all things as we try to live this life in a pleasing manner according to your son. And it's in Jesus' name we say this prayer. Amen.
Well, numbers are down a little bit tonight. Does anybody need a, a piece of the uh, a paper for the from where we were studying last week? Everybody's got theirs. So, okay. This might not be the easiest uh, class to make it be inspiring. We're going to be talking about punishment and uh, hopefully the conclusion of the matter, the conclusion of, of our study on sin. And then uh, next week, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the difficult things that Jesus taught. And uh, just mostly uh, that's a, a conversation about you know, what the things that we find most challenging about uh, the, the teachings of the Savior. And uh, so I, I'm, I just throw that out there and invite you to, to be thinking about uh, what those uh, passages are that, uh, that mean something to you or that have puzzled you, and we can try to work those out together. <clears throat> We're going to be talking a little bit, on, uh, starting on here on the page, which talks about uh, how civil governments deal with sin, and, and we won't deal on this uh, too much. But uh, uh, I, did, I thought it was important if we're going to be talking about sin that we talk about those things that uh, involve uh, uh, the, the government of man. If you look in the right-hand column there, we talk about the scriptural right to punish sin. And there's a couple of passages here that we know, all know very well. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it is be to the king as supreme or unto governors as to them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Again, that was for, they're sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For it is of the will of God that you well doing, you may do so, uh, may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as fee and uh, not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So we all know this one is a, it's, it's one that tells us that we're supposed to obey the, the local uh, authorities. And, and uh, likewise, in, in Romans 13, 1 through 7, uh, it, it gives us that same message. Paul writes and says, uh, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is power, no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. And wherefore, wherefore you, you must needs be subject not only to the, for wrath, but also for the conscience sake. And those are the points I want to bring out of here. Is the fact that uh, he, uh, God has, uh, through Peter and again through Paul, has, has instructed us that we ought to be subject to the authorities. So the question then becomes, what exactly does that mean? And in what cases? Yes, thing that we have, the unique opportunity and problem that we have, the challenge, is that the United States of America is unique among all nations throughout all of history, and that we don't, we don't have a king, we don't have someone who is uh, naturally endowed to lord over us, but rather we have the concept of democracy and equality, the idea that, that elected officials are supposed to be the servants of the people. And then we have a right by our founding documents to have a redress of our grievances. And we have a tradition in this country for um, uh, of social change that uh, 
uh, that, that started back during the civil rights movement, uh, that how people uh, that uh, we have brought about change by, uh, it was called civil disobedience. And not that they were, uh, well, in some cases they may have been breaking the law, but they were breaking uh, the, the mores of the day. And, and at any rate, that, that is uh, a, a challenge that we have because these are very political times that we live in, probably more so than any that I've, I've lived in, uh, where people have uh, very strong, very opposed positions on, on secular matters, but even more so on uh, the concept of, of what our nation was founded on. And so the, uh, the, the founding documents are quite clear. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The founding fathers knew that only, that only the spirit of God can change the heart of men. And they made that clear in these documents. And it's impossible to, m to mandate moral behavior by law. And given that a taste, of fr a taste of freedom, people would always rebel against restrictions imposed by government. So we have a, gov a government, we have a country that was built out of rebellion and, and it has, uh, by its, its very founding documents, enabled people to, uh, to express themselves and to regress for uh, change in the government. And so uh, it, it's not within us as Christians to be, uh, how am I going to say this? We're, we're not intended to be the rabble rousers but also we're not intended to be uh, people who will accept that which is, is not right, it's, not, it's evil, it's unjust. And so we have a, a fine line that we have to walk there, uh, an opportunity, but it's, 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 it's a challenge for us. Uh, <coughs> the, the, it's, we can talk about some specifics, so I don't, don't want to belabor the point too long, but uh, the government has sort of rationalized morality throughout the years. There once was a time when playing the lottery, for instance, was a, a significant crime, a federal crime, and, and people were chased down and, and the mobsters ran, ran the numbers and so forth. Well, today, the government runs the lottery. It didn't, did that make it any, any less sinful? Did it make it somehow morally right? If you, if you look at the, the the advertisements on television, it, it makes it sound like it's your moral obligation to play the lottery because, you know, because they take a tiny fraction of that and they give it to uh, seniors programs or to a kids, you know, to a school or something. And, and <coughs> that's, that's a challenge that we have is to think about wh what is, what did we have with um, more responsibility regarding these things which traditionally were called sin taxes. Uh, tobacco and alcohol were the primary ones that people, the government raised money off of. You know, they tried to ban alcohol, that failed miserably, and so they said, okay, well, we're just going to tax it. And tobacco is the same sort of way. You, it, it, it kills people, but uh, we're going to still let you sell it, but we're going to tax it. And, and, and in some states, today we see marijuana and prostitution taking that same course. These are things which are clearly um, uh, not, not right. And, and yet the government says, well, we can, we can regulate this. We'll make it lawful, but then we'll regulate it, and then we'll take tax monies off of it, and somehow that makes it right. Right, but that gave them a, a stature in the community, yeah. right? Yeah. Gave them a following and, and it gave them some protection in, in many ways. But we're seeing the, we're seeing the, concept, uh, the consequence of some of these things, like gambling. It was the government who had the right to, uh, to run a lottery and then g gaming was re uh, relegated to Nevada and then, and then Atlantic City and now it's on an app on your telephone. And it's it wherever you want it to be, and and it's and the, the there's a promotion for that 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 the, we're going to be able to uh, 
uh, you have people who are going to be able to gamble away their life savings and, and just uh, any any whim that they have. It's it's their business, so um, that they should be able to partake of it. That's the, the arguments for this is that laws cannot eliminate the lust of mankind. So why control the uh, not control the place and manner in which the sin is consumed and let the government benefit from the tax revenue. And living in our modern advanced society, we deserve to be free, and the Constitution guarantees each person happiness, so why not? As long as it's, I'm not hurting anyone else, I sh uh, else, I should be allowed to do whatever I want, and the tax revenues are good for the community. Those are the arguments in favor of it. The arguments against are that uh, taxing a sinful heart would not make it righteous. It only, makes, it only hardens the rebellion. And if sin taxes are successful in discouraging sinful behavior, then they won't contribute much to, to tax revenues because then people would, would decline. We know that that's not the case. It does cause some people to buy fewer cigarettes or, or, um, uh, or, or to stop smoking, but it, in generally speaking, tax revenues from tobacco increase every year, no matter what. And, in the, and the bottom line is sin is still sin, even if the government ordains it to be legal. Now I put at the bottom of this page just some other things that, that uh, and I ask what's next in terms of, uh, uh, these are not all sins, but uh, you know, th they already tax um, uh, soda pop, for instance. In some of the major cities, they tax it very heavily because it's a, a, an issue of trying to f encourage you or to force you to recognize uh, uh, your tendency toward obesity if you're drinking these sodas, and so they tax it. In West Virginia, if you've noticed, there's a little outline of the state of West Virginia on the top of your can of soda. That's, that's a tax stamp. It means that you know, they, the bottler has paid one penny for that, for that tax stamp, and that penny goes to Ruby Memorial Hospital in, uh, in Morgantown. It funds WVU Hospital. And you know, those, are, those, are, those are things. Uh, there's been just, there's some places in the country where they actually tax fast food at a higher rate. Uh, there, there's some, been some discussion. I mean, there is now a discussion if, if people don't want to become vaccinated. Uh, the, this is not the government, but some employers are, are charging them a, a surtax on their health insurance because they figure that they're gonna eventually going to have to pay for their health care at, at a higher rate. Uh, but all these things are just, again, it's just a, a way of, of the government having its way to, to raise monies and to um, to try to um, create a morality in some fashions. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's really the motivating point any longer, but uh, it used to be that, uh, you know, gambling and, and certainly alcohol and during Prohibition, those things were, were, were uh, eliminated. They were legislated against because it, they were viewed as being harmful to um, the morality of the country such as it is. Uh, there just isn't that kind of morale, interest in morality anymore. Yeah, Louis. Yeah. Which was worse, yeah. <laughs> well, what it, what it proved, what that proved, and, and people supporting marijuana, uh, uh, the same thing, yeah. that people are going to do what they're going to do. And uh, so why not uh, you know, try to regulate it in some fashion? Um, and sorry? And the government will benefit. And the government will benefit, yeah. <laughs> if you look at that uh, next page, I won't spend much time on this. I thought about skipping over, but I just put a couple things here. What the what other countries are doing. Uh, Russia, for instance, uh, uh, has the same sort of thing with alcohol and cigarettes. Uh, and it, they uh, indicate that uh, by smoking a pack of cigarettes, you're giving more to help to solve the social problems and boost, uh, boost demographics, developing other social services, and upholding birth rates. That's what the, the Russians thought. Yeah. Yeah, they're smart enough to not even try, yeah. Uh, but you see, things, things countries across Europe, if you look 
you can see them advertise the different issues there. Uh, they have a, uh, Slovakia has a, a bottle cap uh, amendment uh, that uh, you know, they're trying to outlaw bootleg liquor, Hungary, uh, a new tax on poker. Um, uh, Poland is set to lift its excise tax on cigarettes and Bulgaria and so on. <coughs> in, in Iran, of course, the diff it's a very different story there because they live under Sharia law. <coughs> and, and there, uh, the penalties are much stiffer. Uh, and I give here an example of uh, a, stony, a, a charge against an Iranian mother uh, who is a, a, a claimed that uh, she had faced uh, uh, a d death after having been tortured by an alleged adulterer. Uh, in in uh, 2006, she was convict convicted of having an illicit relationship with and was g given 99 lashes. Uh, so she was beaten severely. Uh, this time, since th this time, the 43-year-old has been in jail. I wish she recanted the confession she made under the duress of the lashing. And uh, she was recently dragged into a court and retried. Again, she was convicted, and despite the punishment she'd already uh, endured, she was sentenced to be stoned to death. <coughs> and this, uh, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a common occurrence in Sharia law. And this is, you know, a, a law that governs uh, you know, a billion and a half people across the country, across the world, excuse me. <coughs> and we're gonna talk in a minute about more about Singapore, but Singapore, is, a, is, a, is another place where they, they don't have uh, the religious aspects of, of, of law like Sharia, but they have a, civ a civil law, and, and the king there enforces it uh, very, uh, very um, significantly. In fact, they have a, a punishment there called caning, which is like a lashes, but it's, it's being beaten with canes across the back. And this is a punishment that's done in public so that they can get uh, the message across that certain things are not uh, not to be tolerated. Uh, due to aggressive law enforcement there, drug abuse in that country is almost n nil. And uh, they, they, uh, they have a, a booming economy and, and, and people wanting to get in there. They, they have very strict immigration rules and, um, and so on. But we'll talk more about Singapore in a little bit. <coughs> if you look at that uh, next page, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, God's plan for uh, punishment is part of God's plan of redemption. And in the left column, uh, I mentioned three verses there that uh, from Matthew that Jesus spoke. Uh, Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in the last day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done wonderful works? And then <clears throat> will I profess unto them. I never knew you depart from me, you that work iniquity. So again, this is not punishment uh, on earth, but this is punishment in the form of judgment. And this is something that we have, and it is when we talk about the fear of the Lord, this is part of it. That we have fear in terms of respect for, for God, but we also have a very strong fear that we're going to fail him, that we're going to um, somehow run afoul of him and that we're going to suffer this punishment. Uh, and this is, is, is one of those difficult sayings that we're going to talk about next week, but uh, I'll just cue it up here a little bit. Uh, in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, he, verse 41 in particular, uh, then shall he say unto them that are on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then the other was in Mark 9, 47, 48. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire uh, <coughs> where the uh, worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. So these, these things, again, are part of um, God's plan of redemption. The fact that there is a penalty, there is a punishment. And, and we know that... Um, for instance, in, 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 in Singapore, where the laws are enforced very strictly, I mean, if you, you're guilty of a, of a crime if you spit out gum on the sidewalk, for instance, and you're punished for it publicly. You, you say they don't want gum on the sidewalks. And these are, these are things that uh, the people who live there know and understand, and, and they live by, and, 
and they have a very nice city-state because of that. Uh, in Singapore, violent crime is almost non-existent. For instance, uh, Singapore has a population of, of uh, about four million people, and contrast that to uh, Los Angeles, which is uh, around six million, just a, maybe a little short of that now. And in, in that, in one year, Singapore had 58 murders, and uh, followed by a swift execution of judgment, while Los Angeles had 1,063. It's just an example of the fact that punishment, and the, or the threat of punishment, is a very real um, motivator. That's a good point. In, in the late 60s, there were an average of 6,000 murders a year in the United States. The Supreme Court struck down the death penalty as unconstitutional, and six years later, uh, when it was reinstituted in the early 70s, the number of victims of murder jumped to nearly 16,000 per year. And I don't even know what it's going to be this year. Murder, rates of murder are up 34% this year so far, over, just over last year. So. The, the, uh, the, there's a real problem that we have in this country, and it's, uh, it's not just with the youth, but it is, is, is uh, and there's a dozen different reasons for it. But the fact of the matter is, uh, people don't fear punishment the way they used to. Yes, sir? Well, like you said, the American has been fascinated with the violence that happens, and it's kind of Yeah, you're right. So in a lot of ways, society doesn't want to be around, people don't want to be around one another. That's too easy to have your Facebook friends and never actually see these people, right? Um, it, it is, um, there's something to be said about having somebody to be accountable to, with, even if it's not the government. And, and part of our problem is, is the lack of fathers in the home. I was just talking today with a friend who, who was pointing out a, a, a gentleman in the, in the Charleston community who has taken on and maybe count, uh, counseled um, a dozen different young men who don't have fathers at, at home, but their, their, their mothers bring them to him to get, you know, to get the lecture, to get the fear put in them. And then he says, you know, I'm gonna be checking up on you in school and I'm gonna be doing these things, acting like a surrogate father in some ways. And those kids, uh, he has a tradition of being able to turn those kids around because somebody cared. And, and that is a, that's a very real thing. It's, 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 they don't want to disappoint him. That, yeah, okay, there's a little bit of fear of consequence, but there is the fact that they don't want to disappoint someone. I recall, and forgive me if I told this story before, I'm, I'm getting old and I repeat myself, but there was a few years ago, I was uh, uh, a 
partner of mine, we were, we were talking with a fellow who was a banker there in town, and he was really excited because he had an opportunity to buy a beer distributorship. And he wanted me and my partner to join in with him and, and to buy into this beer distributorship because they are cash cows. They, they produce a lot of cash. And, this, and they don't come up very often. And, this, and, this was, and I, I was sitting there looking at, at this and kind of scratching my head. And my partner looks at me and he says, what are you going to tell the people you go to Sunday school with? <laughs> 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 I just had to laugh out loud. You know, there's no way I can explain this. You know, uh, it rationalize it that you know I'm going to be, uh, you know, hawking beer. To, you know, uh, it just is inconsistent with the way I live my life. So. Well, that's that's the logic of the government. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so in, in a way, you served as my uh, discipline in that way. I didn't want to disappoint you. <laughs> so we didn't buy the beer distributorship. Uh, at any rate, sin has consequences, and we know that. And um, and and whether that consequence is is, is uh, punishment or it's the fear of letting someone down, it, it serves the same purpose. If you turn to that next page, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's important to talk a little bit about uh, something that was written uh, 700 years ago. You know, we've all already talked a lot about Thomas Aquinas and his writings and how extensive they were and how they became the, 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 the foundation of a lot of Catholic, modern Catholic uh, dogma. With this, this fellow, Dante Alighieri, he wrote a, a, a document called uh, the Divine Comedies, and we, the one that's most well known is called the Inferno. Uh, now, remember, in, in, he wrote this in uh, over about seven years back in the early 1300s. He died in 1320, and no, he, he finished in 1320. He died in 1321, so he never actually saw it published. the The tradition is, the story goes, that one of his sons had a vision of him come to him and, and tell him where the doc manuscripts were, that they were hidden in a wall of a house he used to live in. And so the guy went there and dug in the, into the wall and found these manuscripts. And they were copied and, and the likes, but they weren't really published extensively until a couple hundred years later in the, in the middle of the 16th century. The, the, the significance of this is that Dante drew most of his background from the, the Catholic theology written by Thomas Aquinas. Here's this guy popping up again. And, and the reason it's important is because this document itself became something that was commonly known and understood, and almost treated as if it were uh, a, a vision uh, that he had received of, of hell, of what's hell. And we all wonder, what's hell like? And so here, this guy put the pen to paper and, and tried to describe what hell is like. And, um, he, uh, he, he called it, he just called it co the comedies. And, uh, and that in, in the 14th century meant that it was written in the low, uh, low vernacular. It was written in everyday language and it had a happy ending. It was a story that had a happy ending as opposed to a tragedy which was a, written in the high language and it was written much more serious in manner. It was always written using Latin. So don't get, you don't get confused by the word comedy. It's not intended to be funny in, in any way. But Dante wrote, uh, he wrote about the inferno, which is the description of hell. He wrote about purgatory in a second text, and then he wrote about paradise in a third. And most of the, the second and third aren't, aren't, aren't as well known as the first one, inferno, is intended to, to, to reflect the soul's journey toward God through rejection of sin, repentance, and, and then receiving in paradise. The reason this is important is because uh, centuries of people referred to this and knew this as if it were gospel account. And this is how people defined or understood hell to be. Hell was uh, 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 defined as having nine different circles. And you see there in the, on the left side the, the, the idea of the, the circles of, of hell. Um, uh, Dante wanted to be a great author. He, he wanted to write and he wanted to be 
Um, no, he wanted to be known. He, he thought the two greatest poem, poets ever were Homer and Virgil, uh, both who, who had written about the, the Trojan War and the journey back home after that. Virgil's writing was after Homer's uh, a sequel to it about. And so here is, is his, his effort to try to be that guy whose name's going to be remembered forever. And so far, it's worked for him, though he didn't know it at the time. Uh, he, he had this um, love interest called uh, uh, Beatrice, who died at a relatively early age. And so as, his, as he starts the story, he talks about Beatrice going to the Archangel Michael and convincing him to send Virgil to take him through uh, this tour of hell to be able to, to, to describe to people what the punishment is that, that lay ahead. And, uh, and so that he might give a, a, a warning. And you see here, this, some of these, all of these pictures are, are dark. They're tended to be dark, with just enough light to see the victim being, uh, being persecuted here. Uh, the first circle is, 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 and each of these circles from, from one to nine are intended to be a little bit more severe in their punishment. So the first circle is uh, the unbaptized and, uh, and virtuous pagans. And this would include Virgil because he, uh, Dante thought that uh, because Virgil lived uh, and worshiped the pagan gods and he lived before Christ that he couldn't receive uh, salvation. So he's in this first circle of hell with a lot of people, I guess. The second circle of hell had to do with the uh, souls uh, 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 who were uh, uh, blown about in a violent storm without hope of rest. And this was for those who had who were guilty of the sin of lust. Then there was the sin of gluttony, those who were forced to, uh, into a vow of freezing slush there. Uh, then avarice and pro uh, 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 pro uh, prodigality. Uh, the miserly and sprint, spendthrift, spendthrift uh, pushed great weights together and clanging and crashing them together, making the tremendous noise. Fifth circle was wrath and sullenness. Uh, the wrath uh, for uh, fight each other in the, uh, uh, on the surface of the river Styx while, um, uh, while, the, while the sullen gurgle beneath it, gurgle beneath it. Then there is uh, the sixth uh, circle is heresy. Uh, that's where the, the heretics uh, would be trapped in, in flaming tombs. Uh, the seventh is violent, the violent ones. Uh, those who were guilty of violence against people and property, uh, also people who committed suicide and blasphemed and uh, d did other things. Uh, the eighth circle is uh, the circle of fraud. Uh, panderers and seducers, flatterers, sorcerers and, and false prophets and the like. And then the, uh, the ninth uh, circle is treachery. And this is where pl people like Satan and Judas and, and, uh, and he, he po points out the uh, a Brutus and Cassius here because he, <laughs> he had to throw in a little bit of Roman history, right? Now, now we know that that this is this, this is not. I mean, it's, it's like John Milton's Paradise Lost. This this is great poetry, but it's not a true gospel account. Uh, Dante even uses fictional characters in in his in his writings, but he he gives a, an example of of what the people were thinking that hell looked like. And he, he painted the picture of it. And, uh, and it's, I think it's significant that he actually put three popes in the eighth circle of hell in fraud. He didn't, didn't put them in the, in the bottom circle, but it's, it's notable that he actually named these, these three popes and, and, uh, and said, you know, these, these guys are in hell. Um, again, I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I did want to bring it up because, frankly, when, when people start thinking about, um, about punishment, you know, <laughs> hell is the ultimate punishment, and the question is, well, what's, what's it going to be like? Is it just that I'm going to be separated from God, or am I actually going to be tormented the way that the Bible describes it? Yes, sir. Well, 
which do. Yeah, the Bible does talk about both the fear of God and about and having love for God. But I wonder which is the stronger motivator for most people. Because I think that fear is probably more pronounced uh, that that we ought to fear God. And again, as, as I said before, the word fear, as it was used back in those days, did not mean oh I'm terrified. It meant that I have respect for, and I don't want to disappoint you. And you know this. Is um, uh, yeah, I mean there is some some terror in it, no doubt, but uh, uh, fear and love they kind of go hand in hand in some re respects. You can't really fear somebody that you don't off off so love and want to not disappoint. Just a thought. If we look at that uh, next page here on the in his notes. Uh, I will point out uh, a little bit about um, t about temptation because uh, the argument I make here is that sin occurs at the point where we give in to temptation. Now I can be challenged on that, but that's 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 I think is, is an important thing because we know that temptation in itself is not um, is is not evil to to us. Uh, unless we make ourselves available to it willingly. I mean, Christ in, in the model prayer even said, you know, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yeah, temptation is, is something we all have to deal with. He even dealt with it himself as he was tested after 40 days of fasting. But at the point we give in to, to, to temptation is when sin occurs. Uh, th there are I think uh, five steps, which we which we read in the scriptures, that uh, uh, help us to uh, understand how to avoid temptation. Uh, James, the first chapter, verse fourteen, tell, teaches us to recognize our tendency to sin. That every man that is tempted is when he is drawn away from his own of his own lust and enticed. Uh, the second point is uh, that we should flee from evil, as Christ said in, the, in, the, in his instruction to prayer, but also in Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13. Wherefore, let him that, that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above all that you're able, but will with temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So fleeing from evil is, a, is, a, is an important point in avoiding temptation and avoiding sin. The third point, uh, use the word of God to help. In Hebrews 4.12, it tells us, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit. And I know you could pick out a dozen different scriptures giving the same sort of in, uh, encouragement here, but uh, this is the one that I picked out. And I think it's an important point. Fourth point is refocus yourself by praising God. In uh, the 147th Psalm, verse 11, it says, the Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him and in those who uh, that hope in his mercy. And then point five is uh, repent quickly when you fall. First Timothy 6, 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. And also in 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So I think, you know, we have to give the contemplation of the fact that um, we're all going to be tempted. We're going to be tempted every day to sin or to, whether it be to commit a sin or to avoid doing that which we know to be good or to do to not do good is 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 to him a sin and uh, you know I think it's what's important for us to understand is what James wrote in James 1 13 let no man say when he is tempted I am tempted of God 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So we've got to, uh, 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 you know, what I'm, sin, I'm saying is sin doesn't just magically happen. It happens because we allow it ha to happen. We, we were first courted by sin through the temptation of the world, and then we, when we give into that sin, that temptation, then we, then we have sin. That's a, that's a good point, and that's, um, again, one of those scriptures I think is, is sometimes a challenge for us to understand when James said, you count it all uh, blessing when you're tempted to go through multiple temptations because the, the trying that, that temptation tries your faith and makes you stronger. Uh, Jesus did learn about his adversary in that, in that regard. That's a good point. Um, but it is also, he had, he had invested 40 days in fasting and I know he was weak and and, uh, uh, and, and troubled by that, uh, but boy, after you, after you, you've spent 40 days going through that, you would certainly have a clarity of thought, and you, you certainly wouldn't give it away just for the things that uh, the, the Satan was offering. Yeah. Just a thought. We're closing in on the on the hour, but let me let me just say a few words about that last page there, the cl conclusion of the matter, and it is. Uh, uh, it, I just wanted to mention the fact that uh, uh, in Second Corinthians two twelve, Paul says uh, he knew a man in Christ who uh, uh, fourteen years ago was caught up into the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And th this is just an example of where this whole concept of, of, of heaven comes from. We talked about the, the layers of hell, where the, 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 the layers of heaven are, are equally uh, uh, de described. Um, in, in Islam, they have an account of Adam and Eve, just as, as the Jews and the Christians have, but they don't uh, conclude from that the doctrine of original sin. Uh, they, they conclude really something that's just exactly the opposite. They conclude that that uh, we're all born in a natural state of submission to Allah, who they, and to their credit, they, they, they have, they're monotheists. They believe in one God, but they they call him Allah. <clears throat> and true repentance from sin returns a person to that original sinless state. Uh, so uh, the Muslim theology uh, says that mankind's chief failing is pride and rebellion, the, the idea that trying to partner or make themselves equal to God and thus uh, damage the unity with God. And so that's, that's how they, they define uh, you know, uh, the, the state of mankind. And then they go on to describe seven levels of both hell and, and heaven. And you've heard the, uh, the expression seventh heaven yeah, this is I mean, this is part of where where this comes from. Um, Muhammad didn't invent that that idea, uh, but he uh, he parroted his understanding of of the pagan uh, scriptural words and sort of the idea. Um, in in the in the Islamic uh, concept of heaven, uh, it which also prevailed among the Jews, one goes after death to heaven, uh, the heaven he has earned on earth. And the seventh heaven is ruled by Abraham and is the ultimate one. It's the region of pure light lying above the other six, the heaven of heavens. Anyone is in the seventh heaven is said to be in a state of ineffable bliss, having the greatest pleasures possible. 
And so, you know, we, we have this discussion from time to time about are there degrees of punishment, just as, as, as Dante wrote, or and then the question logically is, are there degrees of, of reward? According to Islam, there is. According to the Jews, there, there are. But I'm not sure that there is really any scriptural basis for that. Uh, and, and I don't think we, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. I mean, uh, God said in the, in the Ten Commandments, the punishment for all these ten things is death. It, it didn't say you know a little bit of death or a whole lot of death. It was death, and so I think that the idea is that uh, uh, the punishment and and the reward are both not going to be gradated the way that uh, the way that Islam and Judaism say. Um, the Quran states that uh, uh, Muhammad. Uh, it said that whoever usurps the land of somebody unjustly, his neck will be encircled with it and, and it's set down to the seven earths in the day of resurrection. Down to the seven, er, seventh earth is an allusion to the bottom of hell. And that's where Dante actually found Muhammad in his writings. He actually found him in the seventh level of hell. <coughs> the concept of seven is a sacred number, of course. We've talked about that many times. Uh, the verb, Hebrew word for the verb to swear literally means to come under the influence of seven things. There are seven archangels. Um, there's seven ages of man, according to Hippocrates. Uh, Paul identifies seven pulse, positive virtues, and of course in Revelations there are seven letters to the seven churches, the seven candlesticks. So a lot of a lot of sevens representing the perfection of the God of God's creation. Uh, but um, those are just you know. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the potential for there to be uh, various rewards in heaven. And I think that that's maybe one that we can we can probably pass on because it's, I don't think any of us believe that any of us are going to be rewarded any differently than anyone else. You're either a believer or you're not. And you're either going to be punished or you're going to be rewarded. So that's... The, uh, the lesson on punishment and, and concludes our talk about sin and I'm as relieved as you are. <laughs> <laughs> I think next week might be a little more engaging and we can talk a little bit about, uh, about these scriptures that make us uncomfortable and, uh, and, and have some conversation. If you would please, let's go uh, in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for the opportunity we have together around here and to study your word and we pray that what we've done has been useful and, and, and profitable that we will seek to grow in spirit each and every day and, and study your word and, and to try to keep it close to our hearts help us to resist temptation and, and to flee from evil to, to strive to uh, not sin but to be uh, your holy people for, forgive us Father for having been weak and for having failed you in many ways we pray for your mercy and forgiveness in Jesus holy name Amen <laughs>